Good day, good afternoon, and good night to wherever you are in the world. I am Jonathan. This is the Cello Coach Channel. And today we're going to be answering, or I will be answering to the best of my abilities, your questions for the next hour and a half. So if you don't join in at the beginning, you can definitely join in later on. I'm also going to address some ongoing questions that I've had. And we're already getting questions coming in. So... Uh, okay, I, okay, thanks. So let's just get right into some of your ongoing questions. Hello, nu, Nui Solozano. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name. Um, yes, I will play so. So um, as everybody's getting on, good morning. Um, Sebas, good morning. Iris, hello, uh, Mickey. Hello, Wendy. And again, hello, Oklahoma. Um, something has happened in our life here in France. One of our wonderful chickens, are, um, she's ill today, and so it has taken a great deal of our energy. Yes, we love our chickens like our children, and I think all of God's creatures are, are sacred. So um, at the end of this lesson, I will be inspired to play a little bit of something for my, my little ZZ, my ZZ net. So, yes, I can play Elgar, just not today. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's get right into one thing I want to talk about. We already got one question, and so we have, um, um, Furok. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hello, Puerto Rico. And so let's just get right into here. Can you explain the harmonic notes on the cello? I have heard that you can produce high notes on the cello by slightly touching the string. Now this is a, a, this is a, a lesson in bowing technique. So just to start out, let's get into that first question about harmonics. And I have actually marked on here, if you have your cello out, I have marked on here the different places for the first position and fourth position. I'll zoom in. I can do that today. One man show. Okay, so do do do. Let's do that a little bit. On the cello, if you were to take your instrument, yes, and take the string, the full length of the string. Let's go all the way out a little bit. Now to stay up. That's good. If you were to take the full length of your string, where am I? There. Let's go further. That was a bad idea. Here's the full length of the string, okay? I'm answering the first question that was given to us about harmonics if you're just joining us. And if you were to divide exactly your string in half, which is this place right here, and touch, you will have a certain sound. That sound is exactly one octave above now this goes all the way back to the Greeks, taking lyre, the lyre and the strings of the lyre, and finding out that if you touch the string in a certain place, it created a resonance, a frequency that was related to the resonance of the open. And they found out that was in some way related, as if it was the same, but a bit higher in a higher register. If you were to take that same exact distance now and divide that in half, you were to get one octave above that note. And so that is how harmonics work. But there are other harmonics in here. If we were to take in between those, not necessarily all the way in between, but that is a different note, and that is actually the note that is here, which is D or Re, wherever you are in the world. This is the A, and it's a good cheat because you can shift on. You can use it a lot when you're shifting quickly. The same goes for right here if you have the fourth position tapes. E right here on the A string is also E, but the same that was up here. And even one more, 
there that is. A cool thing about harmonics is they only work if you're exactly on the position. If you're a little bit off, they will still sound, but they'll really sound wonderful if you're on position. And then push down. So when you're up high and you're in your thumb positions, you, ha you are definitely there because it gives it to you. And the last thing about harmonics is that on your cello, you cannot touch here and you cannot touch here. And when I say touch, you literally touch the string. You do not allow fingers to touch on either side. You only touch the string. That is how you play a harmonic. If, you're, if you want to know, there is a way you can tune by harmonics. I haven't tuned yet today. I'm a little flat, tuning to 442 here in France. So I am tuned only my A string. And for demonstration purposes, I will tune my second string out. Use a harmonic here, and the same note is right here. You touch. Now, one of you at home, if you can tell me what is wrong with that string. Let's see. Hello, everyone. So. I'm asking you, is the note, is the D string, the second string, is it too high or too low? And how you know, you listen to the two notes, is the second note I play too high or too low? Let's see if anyone can get that. Thank you, Sebas. It is flat. That means it is too low. Correct. Incorrect. And so you use your tuners and you match them. Almost there. And that is all you need. If you have one of those tuning forks, a diapason we have here in France, all you need is that it gives you an A, and you repeat the same technique for the next strings. And now you are in tune. Uh, there's a different way you can tune, but I'm going to get to that in a different lesson. I do want to talk about the bow. Yes, it is flat low. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Yes, it is the right view. How, so Sebas asks, how does it show harmonics in sheet music? Very good question, Sebas. It is a circle. And so you'll see a note wherever it is in music, and then you'll see a circle above it. It's very much a circle. You have two different types of circles. You have the open A, and then you have the circle circle, which is a little, almost like a degree sign. It's very small, right above the note. And so you'll see maybe a fingering, but it'll be a place where you can put your finger down, but then you'll, that circle means to play it with a harmonic. And that is how notated in music. Hello, Weshla. Hello, Carlos. So, since, um, I'm trying to play Elgar. <laughs> Good morning, I'll play Elgar one day, okay? Not right now. Now let's talk about why we are here. This is the Boeing lesson and I wanna discuss this. I uploaded just last night a bit about the parts of the bow and care for the bow. It's very important to understand that you have a curved part of the bow and straight part. It's basic for some, but it's super important. You must always loosen your bow all the way when you, you store it. And you can loosen to the point where it is separated here and it will definitely not damage it. So it's important to always loosen your bow. How tight it should go. So in the video I talked about making that, those two, that right here, this curve and the straight hair almost parallel and you definitely don't want to do that. 
So a test, you can do this, you'll get used to it as you play music, it changes. With more louder music, you will play with more tension. And with something else, you can variate the tension. I don't suggest you do this all the time, but if you want to learn, place it on your string and push the wood down. Push the baguette onto the cord. And if you can make it there easily, you may be too soft. If it takes a bit of effort, then you're probably just right. So that's how much tension you should put onto it. Yes, ask a question. How many years have you been playing cello? Could just call me E asks. I've been playing cello since I was about eight years old, just turned eight. So I would say I'm going on 31 years. Yeah, 30 years, three decades of playing this wonderful. Gotta tune that. Three decades of playing this wonderful instrument. So. I need to do. Right, back to the bow. How much do you press down? Oh, we have some, now we have some good questions coming for the bow. How much do you press down the bow when you play? Let's first think about how we put pressure on the bow. Okay, now for those of you that have your bows and cellos and watching this, it's wonderful. Make a good bow hand, good, you know, right here, good bow, and place it on the G string. Now, I want you to do the same. I want you to take the stick and make it come in contact with the hair right here. I want you to pull it down and make it come in contact. Again, to be much more specific, I'm going to zoom in and really show you what I'm talking about. So pardon the movement for a moment. Okay, a little bit better here. So here's the, the bow. You want to push down as much as you can. But is it always a push? I'm going to tell you right now, everything that you push down, I'm pushing. And you see what's happening? My arm has to kind of come above and push down. I want you to instead to think about pulling down. I want you to think about pulling back like this, not so much as coming around and pushing in, but grabbing a hold and pulling the bow in. Now, if you do that, I want to show this again. Here I'm pushing down. Look at the elbow. You see that? It's just natural. I'm trying to keep it still, but it's going to go up. It's a different muscle group because now I'm going to pull. Watch what happens here. Do you see that difference? Every action you do on cello can be done with a push, excuse me, every action on cello you do with a push can be done with a pull. This is something that is very evident when you play with other types of bows that I will explain a little bit later in today's lesson. Again, here I am pushing, pushing, and all the weight's going inward like this, like I'm pouring water, okay? Pushing, and now, I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. And the difference is in your back, you're going to actually be using much larger muscle groups to apply pressure. And so when you are coming out like this, what are you doing? Try any down bow. For those of you who have your cellos, try a down bow the way you know, okay, which is going to be pushing. I'm pushing pushing down. Now I'm going to do the same movement down bow, but I'm going to pull the entire way through the down bow. The muscle up here on the shoulder is much more relaxed. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see the shoulder. So the muscle right here is much more relaxed on your shoulder. So how much pressure you should do, you should be, it's an interesting dynamic. You find the midpoint. If you do not know where this is, you should do it with me. <laughs> you 
you should find the place where your, your bow is completely balanced. If you've never done this, I suggest you do it. So this is the point where your bow is completely balanced. I call this zero gravity right here. This is where you have the most control because it is equal weight on both sides. That is where you will have a lot of your most quick movements can be done right here in this general area of the balance point, the point of equilibrium. So when you play on that, this side of the point of equilibrium, the zero gravity, you are using the weight of your arm. So you should lift a little bit more. If you don't, you're going to have a scratchy sound. I will demonstrate. Again, find that point of equilibrium. And there's no cheating in this. You put it on the side of your finger. And there it is. Place it on, let's do the D string. And I'm going to go in and without lifting from my wrist, I'm going to go in and it has that sound. It's, that is a sound of too much pressure, not enough bow. Now back to the same place, instead of being dead weight on my arm, I'm going to lift like a marionette from my wrist. Now I will go out this direction and I'll apply the same concept. I will stay dead weight on my arm. You lose power. So it's the opposite. As you go out, you should put on more and more and more pressure, turning in and pulling toward your body. Hope that helped answer your question. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, how much do you press the bow down when you play? Is it this is the is this the same cello that you use with the last live video? The cello sounds more, more powerful, like the sound of a cello today. <laughs> is it the same cello? I, I, this is the same cello. Um, mics are set up a little bit differently. If it's too loud, just tell me, okay? I'm learning how to do this live stream stuff. Thank you, Iris. Why do you still have tape? Just call me. Because I am a teacher and I just made a video about first position and fourth position. And hence, there's a lot of people in the world who don't know this and so I place tape on the cello to teach. I certainly do not need it, but it is much easier to teach. So do you tilt the bow towards you or away from you? Very good question from Sebas9183. As in this tilt, so this is a great question that's come to us. Do you tilt the bow like this, like this? Here's the thing about bow technique. First, you must understand that you need to be in constant, you want to be in the same place the whole time. A good way to do that is to place your fingers. Here's your two fingers, all right? Place one finger on the fingerboard, a second finger straight, and draw the bow. Can you do that? Close your eyes and do it. As for tilting, maybe like this and like this, you don't do that. As you play, what you need to do is engage right here. You don't see what's happening, but in my hand, as I'm going out, I'm squeezing in. And then as I come closer, I relax. So it's this compression of the hand, and then I'm relaxing and moving up. And I want you to notice something. It all starts with the elbow, and then the wrist follows. Like I did in one of my videos, Elbow first, wrist, wrist. When you pass your knee, it's all elbow. The wrist comes back, the hand follows, and then the, you push back from the elbow. <laughs> I know, I know crazy, huh? I know Iris. <laughs> 
Is it all right to keep your cello in a stand? Thanks, Shen B. Well, yes, I do have a stand right there, and I do keep my cello in it all the time. It is preferred because it's right there. It's right there. Yes, I'll be, uh, <laughs> hello, Janya. Yes, I'm going to be teaching the summer camp in California. Um, I teach in, um, oh, I guess I'll get more head right here. Do, do, do. Since I'm talking to you guys, might as well get a little head. <laughs> ah, better. Yes, I teach in California every summer um, in Northern California at Redwood City. There is a camp for kids between the age of 6 and 14, and I love doing it. It's lots of fun. And every year I arrange something for the kids, and this year we're doing Carmen. So any of you who go to the camp or maybe this will go through some of the campers or actually subscribers, we're playing La Banera. So it will be fun. It will be lots of fun. Good. Glad it's not too loud. You're welcome, Fabio. Thank you. You're welcome, Fabio. I am dedicated to this instrument. I love playing it. And I do things to it, like put tapes on it, because I want it to, I want it to be just easier for you guys to, um, to understand. It's easier to show this is the fourth position, first position and fourth position with tapes. And you can see it very clearly on your side. So, MG Bode, you want to know the horse whiny sound. For those of you who haven't seen The Who, there's this video I have about the modern coeur. And, um, and so I'm going to demonstrate, uh, not the horse, I don't know the horse sound, but I know, I know the seagull sound. Let's try it again. So it sounds like seagulls kind of like, kind of going. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it. It's probably a different harmonic structure, a little bit more. Of course, it's not, but distance is on the um, on the uh, the modern cœur. So that's the best I can do for a sound of like that. We have a question from Colin. Hey, Colin. I th um, thank you once again for picking up a scale book. Um, which piece of the bow is the best to play fast? Ari. Tarantella, all the quavers. Um, I believe. Uh, that stuff. I'm sorry, I did do that right. A fake uh, song in one of the Suzuki books, Squire, uh, 50 song. Of course, fun. Fun, fun tune, fun tune. All the quavers, for those who don't know what a quaver is, that is an eighth note. Um, so, in that particular piece, you definitely want to stay further away from the frog. Like I said, this is the point of zero gravity. The closer you get to your frog, you will become more heavy. And so, definitely keep it here in the midpoint, see even some at the tip. You will be much more in control, especially during those legatos. So, keep it there. Right. I will definitely have to play that one day much better. <laughs> Joshua. Hello, Joshua Salmon. In music, how do they sustain the note for many measures without a break in sound when there is only a certain length of bow? Well, let's go back on the bow and I'll show you.
It is a technique that it is very difficult to learn at the beginning of cello because your bow changes when you go, when you're first at the very tip here. You have to be so nuanced, not only in your wrist, your fingers, and your fingertips, and you can't grab it. If I do a little suddenly, You have to be almost like a feather drifting off, yet still staying in the most delicate contact with the string. It's a technique that you always have to work on. It's gentle right here in the hand. And this course is gentle, most gentle in your string crosses. I like I was saying earlier, right here, you're lifting your hand. You're lifting so you can keep as clear as possible. And if it doesn't sound, if it sounds like one person doing it, but if a group of people, we change a little bit at the different times so it sounds like one bow stroke. So that's, uh, that's good. Let's go back up. So thank you, Josh. Luna Moonraker. Mom, mom raker. Hello, Luna. <laughs> Hello, Luna. How much rosin should you use on your bow? I think I use a little too much. I made a video about that. There is good stuff. I made a video about that. So um, right, watch the video. Um, too much rosin, you'll just know it just becomes crazy. You can always wipe it off but um, too much rosin, it just gets too sticky and you can't really move the bow. It's very difficult to play. You're welcome, Robert. Really? Well, I'm glad that you bought a cello, Robert. Xian. Xi Yuan. Hello. How to move the bow from D string to A string smoothly? Very good question. Let's look. Right. So D string to A string. Let's even get even a little bit lower so I can, I can do this better. <laughs> better. String crossings. String crossings are a product of controlling the pressure, deciding on the angle, and also nuance here that's happening throughout your elbow, your wrist, and your fingers. When you do that, you should be aware the string you're going to is lighter, so not the same pressure. You have the lightest pressure here, the heaviest pressure here. And if you can think of anything, think of pushing a thread through a needle for each and every one of your up bows. You push through. And for those of you that have, have sewn something, or if you haven't, I suggest you do this. I'm not kidding. Go find a needle that you sew with and push a thread through the tip of a needle. If you force it, it's never going to go through. You must be gentle. You must be precise. It's the same thing. When you go, you lift. You make contact and then you move. You practice this slowly. Down bow, pull, change, stop, push. And the push happens here. Take notice of what happens in the wrist and the elbow. I'm pulling with the elbow. I'm changing. I'm going to lead with the wrist. If I could slow it down, I could. You do it on the G string, elbow first, change, now the wrist will lead. Did you see that? You have to be aware of this part and this part of your body more. You're firm and gentle here, controlling the weight, of course, with your elbow, but when you establish up, think again so much like you are a marionette and you're leading. This part of your bow hand is the dominant part. Not this, not this. This pulls, that pushes. This pulls, and that pushes.
We have, uh, you went last year playing cello privately for a year and improved it. I look forward to doing camp uh, this year in addition to the chamber music program as well. Cool, John. Yeah, well, I guess you are a camper. Very cool. <laughs> we're going to do a, I love going, I love teaching the kids. Kids are wonderful. I love teaching the children. Um, it's something I, I adore. All right, Sebas. How do you play? Oh, that's another great question from Sebas. I'm going to keep answering these because they're Boeing questions. We're here at the Bow. Sebas, once again, 9183. How do you play fast while not using much bow? Well, think about if you're playing anything quickly. <laughs> The faster, the faster you get, the shorter your bow strokes get, the more staccato you play, and there, then it just becomes a coordination of what's happening in the left hand and the right hand. And so when you play, how to play again, he asks exactly how do you play fast while not using much bow. You want to stay in this area right here. You're too close, you can't play fast. And a little further out, you may lose a little bit of control, but staccato, staccato, staccato. <laughs> Stiffen up here when it comes to your bow arm. Your bow arm stays nice and taut. The wrist becomes the vocal movement of everything and it becomes very spring and you use. A way to learn a passage of music that is quick. If you're trying to learn something and it is, it is a bunch of eighth notes that go through, here's a technique. If you want to learn how to play, for instance, a G major scale. It's not just enough to play that. I suggest you do this. Play this pattern. Notice it's not pretty. I'm saying, staying on the string. That is because when it speeds up, none of that will be heard. When you have mastered that, alternate the pattern to this. And when you have completed that, all staccato, all very on the string, short, the, sh the faster you get, the shorter you use, then play them equal length. That's a little bit of how to play quickly with your bow. Let's keep going. You're welcome, Josh. Hussein Ali, hello Hussein. Is it a bowing question? Yes. Do you recommend any accessories to improve your bow grip? Do any of your students use them with benefit? Um, your bow grip, you already have this wonderful, this wonderful grip right here. I suggest that you use it very much. Um, as for, there's a, you can use um, silicon, you can use a silicon sort of um, operating tube that they sell for hospital supplies and you can place it above that to give you a little more sponge. That makes things a little more heavy, but I suggest that you honestly use this part, this, the garniture, you use the garniture to your best ed of your advantage. And just remember, it's mostly here with these two fingers. These stay flat across, but it's mostly that. There are other things, I think there is something called a cellophant, like an elephant that you put on. Look, all those things, those covers get in the way. You need to learn how to hold your bow like this. You need to learn that the garniture is there. We're talking about centuries of technology of research has gone into this. This is the tort, tort bow. <laughs> I have a problem pronouncing that word. So 
just get used to that. If, you, if anything, wrap extra leather around this piece right here. That will help you out a lot. Greg and Lori. Hello, Greg and Lori. Which is the best way to learn the names of notes for someone who learns them easily by ear? I will have a, a lesson about reading notes shortly. Um, uh, learning them by ear? What can I tell you? I, I'm, I'm going to have to talk about it in another live stream. But um, it's definitely something that we will do one day. Uh, hello, Christy. Okay. Any advice for making scales more interesting? Yes, Christine Stufflebeam. <laughs> you can play them. You can play them all sorts of ways. Scales are there to drill into your head where these are. You can try them with different strokes, but you want to know the most interesting way? You download my app and you try to keep every note so perfect. Or if you want, try it with no open strings. Try it in thumb position. <laughs> There's all sorts of ways you can make them fun and interesting. Scales are there as your alphabet. You must learn them, you must memorize them, and that's really it about scales. How often do you change the bow hair? Is that the next question we have? Um, how often do you change the bow hair? Well, the bow hair has changed as you need it. I haven't changed this in a while. Bow hair lasted quite a long time, but I may make a video about how I needed to change my bow hair. Eventually, one day you find out you need to change it. Anyway, I have a video coming up about synthetic bow hair that we develop here in France, so watch out for that one. Let's continue. Colin, you're, think you're welcome for the explanation. So when you need to play a fast piece, short bows between the center of gravity, you stated, at, and yes, yes, of, of course, Colin. Faster means you must be shorter and in this area where the bow has its point of absolute equilibrium. Let's go and get that right. Again, as quickly as you can. How quickly can you find that? that point of equilibrium. Put a piece of tape here, get used to, this is where you're at. And here's another thing I wanna talk about. This right here, this is not, in my pedagogy, this is not your frog. This is your frog. You need to get used to, this is the end of your bow. And I'll explain that in a short moment as to why this is the end of your bow, not here. And this is not a frog, by the way. It's offensive to call it a frog. Hi, I'm Mr. Polar Bear and friends dog. I have a $156 cello and it's awful. How much was your cello? My cello, my cello was uh, much more than that. Much more than that. It was, um, it's, it's, um, yeah, MG Bogue, uh, have an Edgar Roos cello and, um, and Edgar's cello start at $7,000. This is a master cello made by Edgar himself in his own hands and so those are the most um uh, the premium cellos that you can buy from this cremonese luthier which i love very much he's a wonderful guy he's got a youtube channel check it out i'm going to continue with uh colin ask another question how would you also mind explaining would you mind explaining one of your videos where you showed using large large uh, and string changes, using largo and string changes to use the minimum movements. Um, use, uh, use the math as, oh, you were talking about the, um, we're talking about the uh, fingering. So I'll do that in another, uh, another video because I'm doing bow technique today. But good question, Colin. That'll be for the, the up here, that video where we're up here, not today. 
which is the best way to play the loudest and the softest? Very good question. So volume comes from this part of your body. This is 80% of your sound production. Here I am. I'm playing the box suite right here. You can't hear it. I have to do this. <laughs> So how do you get the most sound, the loudest and the softest? Well, technically, the further you are out, the softer you will be. And the closer you are here, the louder it will be because it's just simply heavier. You don't want to think so much as loud and soft. You want to think about more power and less power. You want to think about more presence and less presence. You can be present up here and less present up here. But if you just want to think about volume, more volume happens here, less volume happens here, yet the more pressure you put, you can variate that as you play. Karen Ingram asks, what was the Bach music you said you started practicing last week? You called it, <laughs> you called it, do this do, yes, it was the Bible to cello. So the Bach suites, the Bach suites, there's just plenty of them. And since I can just, you know, there's one I'm playing from the first suite today. And so the box suites are a, a collection of six suites that we have for cello. It was written presumably for the instrument of we have today, but may not have been. So everybody kind of knows the very first suite. And so it is quite, you know, popular. Um, and so the first suite is quite often the most played. Yet, the oft ignored second, third, and fourth, fifth, and sixth suites. Here's the second prelude. to the second suite, one of the more, you know, sad suites. And there's a collection of six of them. There's many of them, of course. The very joyous third suite, Prelude. There is so much you can learn from these suites, and there's four, five, and six. There's even one you have to detune your cello. It's a collection of the Bach unaccompanied suite for cello. Everyone should buy a copy and start learning them at any level. I am very supportive of that. Whoop -boo -boo. Okay, there's that. Well, and Karen Ingram, great question. Where does your thumb, where does the thumb go when you hold the bow? Here's the thumb, and let's go into exactly where the thumb goes. I'm gonna go into multi, there we go. Here's our, th our bow, All right. Are we focusing on that right now? Can we get me a focus? All right, there, there it is. The thumb goes here, half on, half off the nook. It's important to know that you're not pushing in, you're not, you're not doing this, I guess, you're not, putting, you're not pushing, pinching like this. You're not doing that. It's angled and it's holding up. It is literally holding the bow up. See that? And these fingers on this angle here, the fingers cup it and your thumb helps 
keep in better control. It gives you more power, more control. You can certainly hold it a little bit that, but the thumb is again half on, half off the nook. This is the nook right here, and this is your this is the, this is the talon right here. Hi, Shy Bull. I don't know what ricochet is, so send me a link. <laughs> uh, hello, Book Dragon. I'm glad your dog likes cello. Let's continue. So, a great question. Very specific. We'll get to that. Thank you, sir. Um, how do you play in thumb position? Need Apple version of the app? Yes, I know, Christine. It will come. What rosin do I use? I use a Piastro uh, all Olive Eva. I link it in all the videos. You can buy any things I have in the video. How do you play in thumb position? Well, you just play like this. They're right here. Now with thumb position, it's the same as first position. In any position, you are engaging the instrument with all your fingers. And you're pushing down you're not doing this sort of separate thing you must just engage them the whole time you're pushing so thumb is Literally, you're pulling in the whole time with this part of your thumb right here. I'll do a demonstration of thumb position more when we have a different angle. But you're really, Sebas, you're really pulling in with your, with, your, with your hand right here. You're pulling it a lot like that. And so that is what thumb position is all about. Really just engaging the instrument and uh, killing all the nerves in this part of your hand. <laughs> uh, anyway. How often do I change strings? Not often enough. Watch my video about that. I'm looking for some fun etudes f with double stops. Do you know some? I do. Check out Popper. Um, there's wonderful stuff in Popper. I'm going to look right now if you want. Do, do, do. I'm going to, there's actually a wonderful one. I'm just thinking, I can't think of the name. Boop, boop, boop. Lee, by the way, Lee, Sebastian Lee, if you don't want to do popper, then, then Lee. Lee would be the one to go into for double stops. And honestly, if you can find a copy of, of um, Romance, number one, by Beethoven for cello, that has double stops. And it, number nine, that's the one I was thinking about. Number nine in um, popper is a great one. It's all double stops. Nothing too crazy. Check that out if you want to learn some double stops for your higher level stuff. Otherwise, Sebastian Lee. Sebastian Lee. Good morning, Kyle Taylor. Or afternoon in France, yes. I'm having quite a bit of difficulty with string crossings from fourth finger C um, to open D or E. Any advice? Fourth finger C, I guess that's here. <laughs> Now, is your, the thing about these difficulties, is the difficulty like making a sound like, like that, <laughs> sorry for your ears. You mean to, you need to arc your fingers up here a little bit more. Zoom out, there we go, a little bit more. You wanna get better at string crossings, learn to play here holding the fingers down never leaving the string that you're crossing away from you'll improve your string crossings i know there's an hussein well hello hussein ali do i use the international music company version of the six suites or the ones where it is most separate bowings i use urtex sebas and Urtext is, uh, my version is actually uh, Peter's. So my version is uh, Peter's version. And in all actuality, 
my version of the box suites. I'm going to this is let's move this up a little bit again. There we go. So my version of the box suites is a product of lots of urtext um, from the Peters version um, from the inter not the international. I don't like that version, but urtext. But very much like the one I have shared on, I believe I have showed on the channel, is I've been teaching this box suite for a long time, okay, a long time, for at least a solid 15 years. And when you teach this instrument, you have to understand there's different levels and there's different things that really make it accessible for everyone. And what we did is I transferred everything into MuseScore for the first suite. And then I tested with the studio for four years, Boeings and fingerings, and found out the one that everyone was able to play. Not just some esoteric conservatory trained musician can play, but actually everyone could play and enjoy. And we found a different, slightly different take on the Urtex Boeings and stuff like that. But still Keats very much like that. So um, that's the one I use. I don't use the international version. Let's keep going. You're welcome, Sean. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to say, hello, Nancy. Nancy, hello, hi. I would like to know a technique to play better dynamics with the bow. For example, forte, piano, pianissimo, etc. Well, how do you play better dynamics with the bow? You start by finding where you are when it comes to these things. Forte, piano, mezzo forte, all these different levels are all relative to where you're playing. So if you're playing, let's say, with a group of brass players, it's going to be always loud. But a good way is to play a note. And if that is equal effort, then use less effort. It's not about playing loud and soft. It's about more and less effort. It's about less, it's about staying present, yet controlling the output. The more soft you play, the more engaging and lifting of your arm. The more forceful you play, the more present you are, the more engaging you are in your arm. And to get rid of that at the beginning, don't engage so much at the onset. It's very much engaging here and here. You have to know what it sounds like. So my best suggestion for any beginner, find out what medium, what soft, and what loud is. And don't think of it as medium soft loud. Really think about as present. Your and just being present is forte. Being heard, which I'm excuse, present is mezzo forte. Being heard is forte. And hiding and having people to really strain to listen. That's uh that's that's piano. That's something you can just think about. Chrissy asks which type of bow do you prefer, carbon or wood? Which are the differences? Since we're talking about bows, I love my bow. It's made of Puerto It is a, an endangered wood. I certainly enjoy my bow very much. It was made by hand by a master luthier in San Jose, California, uh, Jian Li. And Jian Li um, created this over a period of two years. I specially ordered this. It cost me a considerable amount of money, but I fell in love with it so much so I ordered a second from him, and um, this is his second. And so it is made of uh, is made of Puerto all handcrafted, lizard skin, you know, you know, silver, all those wonderful little details of, of luxury. But it plays incredible. Yet for my next bow, I will be purchasing when I do get there. I will be purchasing a carbon fiber bow, and I will string it with synthetic which we have the synthetic crown here in Toulouse. So the future for me is carbon fiber, definitely for the bow. Why? Because Pernambuco is wonderful, but it is endangered wood. And we have to be realistic. 
you here, here on our bows, for those of you that are vegan or vegetarian, I'm sorry, but here on your bow, you have the skin of an animal, you have the inside of a shell, you have the tail of a horse, and for those of you with really luxurious bows, you have, this is the kneecap of a camel from Pakistan. I, I know the origin. So this is bone right here. It's all very much, and of course, endangered wood from Brazil. And so if I could make a less of a carbon footprint with my bow, and I hope others will follow in, in step, then going carbon fiber would be great. They're engineered wonderfully, and they're quite light, so I suggest getting heavy one. Since I'm talking about this, I do want to talk about... <clears throat> we always... Um, I do want to talk about the, the differences in bows. I have here because it's been asked. I have here. This is a Baroque bow, legitimate Baroque bow. And to show you the differences, you know, there are some cosmetic differences. For instance, here is the tip of this bow here. And then we have just side by side. This is the tip of a Baroque bow. This is a Baroque bow here. Can you see that? That's a Baroque tip, and that is the tip of the Tote bow right here. So that isn't as, as much difference. They have, you know, basically the same length, if you will. The major difference comes here at the end, at the talon. And so I'm going to show those, and we can get those right here. So this is a bow you're probably used to, but this is a Baroque end right here. And as you see, it has this cut off. It's made of completely of wood. The end piece right here, le bouton, is also made of wood. And another thing that a lot of people don't realize is this bow has a, has a big space here. Look how big this space is right here. This does not, this is much smaller. I'm going to try to set my finger, I'm try to set my middle finger and my little, my finger, see that? It doesn't fit, okay? But watch this, I'm gonna switch bows. Finger fits perfectly. This is a Baroque bow. And last thing is that it doesn't have a virole. So the piece right here that guides through, it has no virole. It is completely open on the bottom side. And if you, you can also see a little bit the thickness, this is so much thinner. It's half the amount of hair from a tot bow. Now, why would anyone, and this was asked to me on the channel, why would anyone prefer this bow over that, over one of these. Well, one of the concepts is it is lighter, and it is lighter. I have a scale right here. I'm gonna pull that up. Here's our scale. <laughs> and we're gonna weigh this bow. First, to give you the weight of a typical tot bow. Tot, tot bow. This is my, uh, it's my favorite bow right here. And a good bow will weigh anywhere anywhere between 78 to 82 on the high, things like that. This bow is 82 grams. So it's about the range of what you would have for a tote bow, a quality tote bow. We can talk about weights. If you want to really know about weight of cello bows, we can definitely get into that because that's why I want to talk about. This bow here, the Baroque bow, weighs 76.1 grams, almost six grams less. It is significantly lighter. Not only is the bow lighter, not only does it have less hair, but as you go closer to the tip with this bow, it is much, it doesn't have the power because here, you have the space that goes up, so you actually have much more volume production on the end of a tote bow. But on the end of a Baroque bow, as you see it comes in, that doesn't give you the same. There's no significant difference in the volume production, but there is one thing, and really one thing only you should consider playing with a Baroque bow, 
if you actually did it because you can make you can do most of the things if not everything with that with most modern music except one thing and I'll demonstrate that I've been looking forward to this part <laughs> okay so we get this out of the way Like I said to you just now, the this bow here has a very interesting and very different shape to the frog. And I've always wondered what this does. Now I know, because the Baroque bow is not always can be held like this. It also can be held like this. And this, I'm going to show the inside. This right here, this flat piece, goes against the palm. And you play like this. And when you're playing like this, you can't get very close, hence the reason why I say the frog starts, if you look right here, you, you lose, we'll put them side by side again. When you play like this on, on the tult, on the Baroque bow, you can't really play in this entire section right here. It's just unused because you're just, it's not impossible. And when you put your hand on this side, of course, you can play all the way. Should you get a Baroque bow? Is it more authentic to play with a Baroque bow? Unless you have a Baroque cello, which I will have next month. And I will show you exactly why this bow works great with a Baroque cello. But if you don't have that, there's no reason anyone should have this. Unless you play like this. And you, I think you're using more stick. I'm very new to this and I like it, but this is, I have to say, this is very, very cool playing like this. And it really changes everything. And here's another thing I want to talk about since I have this bow out. In French, they do not say up and down. So if you, anyone watching this, speaking English and who's learned up and down, remove that from your vocabulary. Think pull and push. Here in France, on dirait, dirait, pousser. You pull, you push. And it's so much more evident when you play like this, you're pulling and you're pushing. It's the same thing if you were to turn like this. Pulling and pushing. But you lose the sensations. For those of you who have your torque bow, try that. Invert your hand, place it on the bottom, and really feel the pull. wonderful to play like that and you really get into the the origin of why it's shaped like this it's because of that there you go so if you're not playing like this there's honestly in my opinion no reason to have a broke bow one of the subscribers asked that on the channel recently and I got the broke bow and uh, next month I'll be getting the Baroque cello there is a significant difference between a cello like this and the Baroque cello. I live in France, so literally Baroque cellos are everywhere. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So um, that, that's definitely what I wanted to, do, to talk about.
Quick question from Sebas9183. How do you make harmonics loud? More bow. More bow. That's it. Less bow, more bow. It's the same as everything. More bow, more rosin. I don't know what I was answering, Karen, but um, I don't know <laughs> what you asked. I don't know what she asked. Sorry. I... Yeah, <laughs> so. And um, Karen says, um, her teacher says, goes be, uh, um, it goes behind that. So she's talking about this right here. And here's the thing what I wanted to talk about when it comes to how you learn with your teachers and how this channel kind of fits into your life as students. This channel, I'm here to help you answer some of those other questions. You take answers and you take advice from different people, but never take advice from someone that says, it works for me, so it should work for you. We're all anatomically different. I'm so very clear about that. And so, but if you think about the logic, which I use a lot in this channel, logic and science, if you have two opposing forces, Karen, and they're pushing in and out, well, you're probably going to have a lot of stress here on your muscle. But if you place the thumb ever so much on the tip of the side, not in like this, I'm not doing that, but on its side, I'm using very much the tip and it's, and it's hard to demonstrate, but this is how you should do it. It should never be completely on this side because two opposing forces causes you to have cramps. But then again, your teacher is there with you they see your, your progress and they can adjust your position and your technique in real time. So definitely take the advice of your teacher more than anything that you see online. If you see something contradictory, uh, present it to your teacher. And if your teacher cannot provide an evidence-based response that is not um, contingent upon their anecdote, upon their personal life, but something that works for everyone, they could teach a random stranger, then, then, then it's more valid. But your teacher knows your strengths and your weaknesses. And that's the way this channel works. It helps you answer those other questions when you need. I am telling you, Karen, that when you place your thumb, your thumb should not go all the way in. No, nothing like that. But your thumb should definitely place a little bit on its tip. Play, playing like this. Two opposing forces the whole time will cause a cramp. It's just science. There's, there's, it's, it's just reality, okay? Doing this, pinching the whole time, this goes there. Because in all honesty, you can play without the thumb as long as you're moving. You can play completely like... If you go quick enough, the thumb stays in contact. But here's another thing. If you are playing a lot, you need to keep your hand from moving, okay? So your thumb should put a little bit on the end of the talon here, a little bit to stop it from moving. Otherwise, it flies out. It's a nice grip. This here, the garniture is there for a reason. Two fingers there, one finger there. It's designed for a reason. It's held this way with broke style because they hold it like this, but moreover, they hold it even deeper like that but they're still holding a little bit below. You're still holding it up. So, but then again, your teacher knows you best, Karen. Definitely knows you best. And that's what I like is on this channel, Karen just brought up something about debate. And I want people to definitely be open to other people, especially for somebody who, um, who has really been doing them um, I got a lot of questions. Great, great. Here, come on. Where is it? I'm going back. Okay. Karen talks about debates on the channel, and it's you know it's a wonderful thing to have debates. Be open. That's what I'm about. Evolution, always evolving, and learning from everyone else. And the thing about teaching music is the whole idea is for you to access the music, enjoy it, and express yourself. We all have different ways, as long as you enjoy doing it. In classical music, there is too much gatekeeping. There are people that says, I paid this much money for this instrument, I pay for this teacher, and thus I'm better than you by default. I'm not that type of guy, and I definitely don't want any of my students to think that they're better than anyone 
by virtue of spending more money or having access to conservatories. The desire to learn comes from the heart and comes from, just comes from within. And if anyone should try to extinguish that in you, just tune them out. They're not worth your time. There's a lot of gatekeeping in classical music. Anyways, I love it though. Is there an ideal Boeing? Azraelius99 says, a de ideal Boeing spot between the bridge and the fingerboard. Yes, there is. You have to do this with me, as in like at home. Take your bow and place it on your cello. Now, I'm not looking exactly where it is. Now on the camera, it kind of looks like it's aligned with these holes right here. Okay. I'm looking down and you, everybody has on a chevalet, everybody has a little face of your man and it has the mustache. And I want you to place, look down at your bridge. If you're doing this with me, look down and see where the intersection of the string and the hair is. Is it right above? Here it is completely in the eyeballs of my man. And that's a bit high. Here is too soft. See, the ideal place to play is right, just right above. And this would be right here. We're all anatomically different and it will be different for everyone. But this right here is the place you'll get the most production with the least amount of stress on the, on the cello. You move up here to more quiet and as you go higher, you have to play, of course, close to the bridge. You don't want to play too close here because then you'll play two strings, especially when you're playing higher, you'll definitely play two strings. So open your body up, look at your bridge, look at the man with the moustache or the person with the moustache and place your bow intersecting the string right above that spot. And keep it there. Do you have any tips on playing the octaves in the Dvorak Cello Concerto Movement 1? Well, no, I don't have any tips on, except practicing them separately. When you do an octave, you play that you really start playing them like that, and then you get a really good. And when you have that set, Shift, 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 back, and I'm actually closing my eyes, it's better, once you get that down, you're looking, look, look, look as much as you can, and then close your eyes, and when you're working on something super technical, when it comes to your left hand, or your bow, close your eyes up. The tapes are there and sort of annoying me because it's not easy to slide with them on there. Ooh. So when you do that, you, you find out that when I slid back here to the F natural, you see with the tips of your fingers, Closing your eyes, I think that's my best advice for, for learning something like those octaves. Playing them separately and then closing your eyes and playing as you go up. And if you can do it five times perfect, then uh, you did pretty good. So, Ken the Eagle, hello Ken, says that I still have a problem with my Bowie bouncing when transitioning. So maybe this sort of this sort of stuff right here. You are too stiff here. Relax, drop that. Here's a tip. Put your bow, for all those of you who have like tense bows, place everything. Ready? Relax. Have that extra step. Every time you play something, about to play something, relax. Get that last bit of relaxation. It'll help you with that stiff hand. The big scale going up. <laughs> the one I played in the video. Um, do uh, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, that rhythm technique I did earlier in it. That's what I'm, what's happening. So good, we have a little. 
So, Sir Nanobot says, I often get scratchy sound when a bow movement, when I start the bow movement, especially on the G-string. It's only start. Once I've started, it sounds okay. Do you have any advice? Of course I do. I'm sorry for the sound I'm about to make. That is a sound of too much pressure, not enough bow. I apologize for the next sound I'm about to make. Okay, it's not that bad. That is a sound I called ghost cello of too much bow, not enough pressure. And so it's a gentle balance between the two. When you're on the G, yes, you use more weight, but you're pulling in. If you're close to the, the frog, you don't have to use so much weight. It's already built in. Allow the arm to guide from the elbow. Do not push down. There's rosin on the bow. There's rosin on the string. Pull. And there's weight in your arm. There's no reason. The only one that you should do a little, a little of a bite, maybe, on the C string to get it going. Because it's so thick. Karen, you put extra leather or something just a little bit more right here. Cover this part of your bow right here. Cover this part because your thumb is going to be engaging a lot. You may even deform your, your nail a little bit. Bonsoir, Julien. You're welcome, Colin. <laughs> yeah, very much. The air who fiddle Iris says it's um very much like that. Very much like that. Absolutely. Karen asks Kyle Tyler asks, do you ever have a problem getting the C string to respond like it wants to play a whole octave higher? It takes a second for the strings to catch, and I just demonstrated that a little bit. <laughs> If you don't put enough pressure, remember, thick string, more pressure, let the arm. Really get into it. Once you get it going, get off the pressure. Get that bite, and then let the, let the inertia keep going forward. Hello, Lolimar. Good, Christy, I'm glad. Ooh, so we have Shan Branting ask, she played cello 50 years ago. Is it too late for me to start cello? Is it too late to become a returning cellist? Absolutely not. It is no time except the present. Get in back into cello is a wonderful thing. Push that back a little bit. Yeah, get back into cello as much as you can because cello is a wonderful thing and, you know, we're not getting any younger. Arthritis will come and take our bodies one day and we simply will not be able to play. A wonderful story I'd like to share with you is one of Pablo Casals. When he was later on in his life, much later, um, one of his... One of, one of his great admirers um, and students at one time, Misha Maisky, he went to his bedside and he was, he was at the end of his life and he played all of the box suites for him, and, which took many hours. He said it was over the course of seven hours he stayed with uh, Casals and he played the suites for him. And it gave him such great pleasure, Pablo, to hear one of his students come to him and spend that special time with him, sharing the music with him. Uh, by that point, Pablo could not play cello anymore. You just get to an age where your body gives up. So there is no time like the present to learn this instrument. And for most of us, 
if you have any opportunity to play for people, I suggest you do so. It's a wonderful thing to share with people. Hi, the hoodie cello. How are you? What are we doing? Holding the bow slightly slanted, Christy asks, on the strings or slightly uh, flat or slightly slanted? I prefer slightly slanted. It's less stress for the body. And that's true. When you, when you push down, because we're using a little bit of our body weight to do so, this we're pulling, we're pulling in more. So when you slightly angle downwards, it is a little more preferred. <laughs> Another good question from Sebas is, um, how do you quickly shift from normal position, I guess I would consider this to be normal position, to thumb position? It's less about what's happening here and more about what's happening here. If your arm is too low and you're not ready to shift up, you know, anything like that, if you're coming back and you're coming in, your elbow must be at a place where you can shift all the way up and all the way down. This is playing like that. Secondly, you have to have your cello ready to do so. So when you're going higher and going lower, this will allow you to move freely. And for those of you that have different ways of remembering the positions, we have different ways. We can use your, your hand right here in different places. But my best suggestion, quickly shifting up and down, is all position that elbow and that's where you're going to get the best improvement is the elbow positioning. You're welcome, Ken the Eagle. Never live too late to play cello. Yes, it's never too late to play cello. So, how long are we going to? Well, it's almost seven o'clock and it's about the end of my um, this this wonderful live stream lesson I did with you guys. The next one will be about teaching um, teaching uh, this stuff up here. You know, little techniques and stuff. There's a lot of things we talked about this. Again, to recap, when you are playing, right? It's elbow. It's all elbow. You start. It's a consequence to everything else. Second thing. It's when you're inside this portion of your body, you're lifting like a marionette. Here, you're pulling more. Here, you're lifting. Understanding that. Making slight adjustments. And if you can, if you can train yourself on an open string, I suggest a G string, and play. your fingers close your eyes these are ways you can self train without a second pair of eyes at your home without looking in the mirror in order to find out if you're bowing straight or not. You can record yourself and you can see how that's going. Remembering there's four different strings with four different pressures. Remember that when you are going in between strings, you have to make contact and then... Understanding, you still have to go to that level and then give a bit of force. Go to that level and then give some force. And it happens within milliseconds of each other. So start slow and start on the string. Playing fast is all about staccato and short strokes.
some some of those trill exercises you can definitely do to help free up those fingers i'll teach in another lesson one day so i really like the fact that everyone is sharing their stories that's a wonderful thing and i want to thank everyone for tuning in asking questions if you have uh, more questions i'm always available just uh, ask them on the channel and and um, I, of course i have to play something because my wonderful my wonderful um my chicken is hurt so i want to play something for her i don't want i don't know what i'm going to play i've been Hmm. I'm gonna play something from. Well, I'm just gonna play something that um beautiful song I discovered via. One of my students long ago, <laughs> long ago, and uh, you know what, as a treat, I'm going to play with the Baroque bow. We have a question from before I go. Last one from Alexander. He says, my head is touching the pitches or how I think maybe it's these things or these things like this um, near the ears. Is it the cello high enough? So, um, you know, you know, I don't know if the pitches are maybe the strings. Um, you know, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Iris. I don't know if that's the same Iris that I taught in California. I don't know if it is. 
If it is, hello, Iris. If it isn't, then I'm... I forget her name. I'm just, oh, I forget. Anyway, there was this lady I taught in San Jose, and she introduced me to this song. She played it, and it was... I'm going to cover it on the channel. It's, it's a great song. It's a great song. It comes from, uh, comes from China, mainland China. Anyway. So, is it to your knee, your ears? Mm. Without knowing if your face, the head touches it, you should have a good distance between here. Okay? You should have a distance there. There should be nothing else. Fist. Fist. There's so much to teach and there's so much to learn. Have this only if you play Baroque cello. Master this. It will come in time. If you stress and if you get crispy and if you get cramped, it's because you're thinking too much. A lot of this comes from your elbows. I'm just recapping. A lot of technique comes from your elbows, shifting, moving. Think pull and push. Don't think up and down. Pull and push. And lastly, if you need something like tapes, put it on your instrument. If you need something on your bow, put it on your instrument. Um, and it was a pleasure. I'll get back into teaching more content on the channel. I appreciate everyone for tuning in. And I will see you guys on YouTube. Bye-bye now. And I will just say thank you here. For such great questions. For the great good. <laughs> Type it with one hand. Bye-bye now. It's always a pleasure.